Hey guys, welcome back to the Derek Lake podcast. Back in the vault again today. We've got a returning guest, one of my favorite guests that we've ever had on, and someone who I've always supported and always will support. We uh, see eye to eye in a lot of things, so I'm excited to have Michelle Tanner back on the podcast. How's it yeah. going? So good. Thanks for having me. I was super excited when you reached out again because it's been a while it's since been I've been minute. on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've crossed paths a few times. We've had lunch a couple times. So yep. every time I see you, the thing about you is like every time I see you, especially when we're talking city council stuff. Yeah. Every time I'm like, and I'm not announcing nothing here, but like every time I'm like, man, I might do city council one day. Yes. You know, and we need you. Hey, there's an election coming up next <laughs> yeah, year, Derek. I'm, not I'm ready just yet. saying. I'm still in the build process of too many things, but uh, I don't know. When when you say that, I'm thinking like, I could probably go do that. I've you got could. opinions. You would be great. And uh, but yeah, there's something about you. I don't know. I don't know if other people feel that or if other people have told you that, but I've always thought whenever we have a conversation, I think it's because like you're so strong in what you stand for and they love you or hate you people know where you stand right and that's what i think is admirable about it and i mean there's i see eye to eye with you on 99.9 percent .9 of the things and even the things i don't i'm like that's a different perspective than i'd thought of but i respect it because i know where you stood on it does that make sense yeah like no, there's I no appreciate that. there's no balking to one side or the other or and, and right even in my eyes, I guess, don't take this the wrong way, but like no. right or wrong, mm -hmm. I still know where you stand. And that's what that's what I like. Yeah. And um, it, we're never going to have anyone that we do agree with 100 percent of the time. Right. And that's what I try to tell people a lot, because obviously I'm heavily involved in the political sphere. I vet a lot of candidates. I get a lot of the candidates on my own podcast mm -hmm. and talk with them as and as I'm talking to community members about how to vet candidates and things to look for, I always reiterate that. Like, look, you are never going to agree with 100% of what someone does or says or stands for. It's just, it's not going to happen. And I mean, really, should we really agree 100% right. of the time, you know? But do they have those basic principles, those core principles? Are they an actual leader or are they just establishment who are going to be a puppet and go along with whatever they're told? So it's those core things that we have to look for and not really worry about some of the minute things that we might not always see eye to eye on 100%. Yeah, like I I, re I respect someone more that at least stand up with their opinion and stand next to it. Right. Whether we're on the same page or not, I just want to know where you stand. I totally agree. That drives me crazy when, especially I've been to a lot of political debates recently sure. because it's election season, a lot of state elections, federal elections going on, and I'm a county and state delegate, and so I've been going to every debate that I possibly can and you can always tell the ones who, like you're saying, who are upfront, straightforward, this is where I stand, take it or leave it, you may not agree with me, right? And then you can tell the other ones who are trying to just kind of tiptoe and cater to the audience and, oh, I'm not going to quite answer that question because I, I can't really read the room. It's like, dude, just tell me what you think. That's yeah. what I care about. I want to know where you stand. Yeah, I'm trying to vote someone in that I can have a conversation with. And I don't know, this wasn't even supposed to get like political right off the bat, but it always gets political <laughs> with me. I can't help it. I gave a, it actually did a speech um, over at Intermountain of all places. Right. Wow. We can get Welcome into back. that story. <laughs> Welcome back. But yeah, we actually should touch on that because that was a really a full circle moment. But I got up there. I'm like, I'm not here to talk political. And of course, it totally ended up being political because I opened it up for questions. And of course, it, it totally shifted gears. So let's start there. Fine. What'd you go there and talk about? So people that don't know, maybe give a brief history of why that's ironic. But yes. um, I'll just kind of let you take that over and tell that story. I'm totally, curious. Totally, Yeah, total full circle moment. So I am a family nurse practitioner. That's actually how I met your wife, yeah. Amanda, um, working in the emergency department. And that's what I did for a decade. I worked in emergency medicine. I love it, still do love it. I think it's a great, um, great field to be in. And, you know, thankfully, I did kind of see the writing on the wall with the healthcare setting and was wise enough to start up my own business on the side as I was working in the emergency department. And when COVID hit, so 2020, 
I was pregnant with my youngest child. I was still working in the ER and then also running my my small business, Bella T Medical. And at first, I was, of course, being very cautious as a, a pregnant frontline healthcare provider and was doing a ton of research on how I could best protect myself, my family. And it didn't take very long, though, to realize the propaganda that was going on, the censoring of science that was happening. It wasn't about virus. And I realized that fairly quickly, and especially when they came out with the mandate on our children with, you know, actually we had evidence and studies to show that we should not be masking healthy elementary children, yet they were mandating that. And as a healthcare provider, as a mother, I could not believe my own eyes. And of course, I'm calling all of the other you know, doctors that I trust saying, help me see what I'm missing here. Why would we be forcing this? And every single one of them that I talked to was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I don't know. This is what the CDC is saying. I, I don't know why we're doing it, but we are. So I had a big problem with that. And I had to make a really conscious decision of being willing to speak up for the truth. And, you know, I knew when I started down that path that it was going to make some people mad. And of sure. course, you know, you worry about losing business. You're a business owner. You know, when you take stands, especially that are deemed political, which I was so naive, I didn't realize that it was even political to say, hey, let's value freedom and medical freedom. Yeah. Doesn't everyone want to choose for themselves whether they want to wear a mask or, you know, get a shot, right? So I didn't realize that was so political, but I did realize it very quickly when saying things like promoting medical freedom landed me, you know, being reported to the medical director of the hospital. And I say I went from hero to zero pretty quickly because it just simply wasn't popular to be a medical professional speaking out against the mainstream narrative at the time. And so, you know, not long after that, the vaccine mandate came out and I was breastfeeding my baby. I had already recovered from the natural infection pretty recently. And here they're telling me, get the shot or you're getting taken off the schedule and you know follow the science i'm thinking right show me the science that shows that a breastfeeding woman who has natural immunity should get this guess what that science doesn't exist in fact the studies that did exist showed that i probably shouldn't get it right so you know using my logic my intuition my background in knowing how to read studies i said no i'm not doing it and, you know, we were talking offline earlier about how vital it is that we have other streams of income so that we aren't tied to an employer telling us what we have to do, right, in order to provide for our families. And I would like to think that even if I didn't have that other stream of income, I still would have said absolutely not, because when injustice becomes law, I believe rebellion becomes duty. Sure. I felt a duty that if I care about the country I'm leaving to my children, if I care about preserving the liberties and freedoms that our founding fathers died for, I have to take a stand on this issue. If we allow them to tell us what we have to put in our bodies, that's it. Like, game over. If well, we allow them to do that to our children, game over. At what point does all that become rebellion? Like, wanting freedom, wanting say, right. wanting. And so it, the whole thing was upside down. When I, and I remember that's when I became aware of you, when all that was going on. And I remember telling Amanda, I'm like, you know, there's this Michelle Tanner. She's she's over at the school board meeting. She's at the, you know, doing all this stuff and becoming more publicly known, or at least to me. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, I know her. I worked with her in the ER and she was still working there at the time right um one question do you think that you would have became maybe as diligent as you were if you weren't pregnant like was that a part of it or i'm just like i'm thinking i could see you just getting sucked in because of that um right. protect baby instinct right yeah and so do you think it would have been so drastic for you if you weren't pregnant i guess i think that's a Good question. I think my maternal instincts for sure were yeah. heightened, right? That that mama bear, right? Of I'm going to do what I have to to protect my kids. But also, I feel like 
and I think a lot of us have this innate sense of justice and liberty and freedom. And I can remember even back to my teenage years, 19 years old, I wanted to go to the Glenn Beck Restoring Honor Rally in Washington, D.C., and I couldn't talk anyone else into going with me. But I felt that we were at this point as a country where we did need to restore our honor. And so I flew out there, 19 years old, to Washington, D.C. And so it's always been something instilled in me that this country is worth defending and worth fighting for. But like everyone else, you know, over that 10 year plus period, like I was in grad school, I was having kids, I was doing all the things that most of us are busy doing, right, which are good noble things but we realized if we can learn anything from 2020 it's how quickly people will give up their god-given freedom under the guise of safety yeah and we we allowed that to happen not attending our city council meetings our school board meetings paying attention to what's going on in our classrooms All of those things led up to them being able to take away those freedoms in the first place. So that's the silver lining for me of 2020 is it was a big wake up call of, oh, we are past the point in this country of worrying about losing our businesses, worrying about losing our jobs. We have to take a stand and a bold stand if we are going to not have a revolution because we don't need a revolution. Our founders did that for us but a restoration. That's what we need in this country. I like that. I like the way you put that. I, it, It's always floated out there about civil war and all that, and it just kind of makes me laugh. And one thing I think, it, going down this road conspiracy, Derek, my tinfoil hat's coming on, but when you were talking about going through that grind, right, having kids, going through school, I'm thinking, yeah, how many of us were distracted when all that stuff started coming down? Yeah. And I remember having conversations with buddies. Of course, this is when the image on the TV where people just falling over dead, walking down the street, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I remember having conversations with my buddies being like, uh, so, so at what point are you guys okay with this? What do you, you know, they're wearing masks. I'm pushing against it. Um, they're trying to keep grandma safe. I'm like, dude, my grandma's going to be all right. I'm healthy. Grandma's die. Sorry to say it, guys, you know, and, and I had one buddy, I'll never forget it. He said, so masks, is that the sword you're willing to fall on? And I, I thought, dude, like at what point are we lining up for the train cars then? And and him and I have never really had a conversation like that ever again because I was just like, dude, I don't know that you and I are on the same page. Right. And I felt the same way. So like when I became aware of you, I'm like, okay, this is someone I can rally behind. Yeah. And uh, I kind of hijacked your story. So I want to bend us oh, back no, to Oh, you're good. And it, you said something that reminded me. So speaking of the masks and the mask mandate, because they did, they told us that our kids need to wear them to protect grandma, right? Because the kids weren't dropping dead. It wasn't even affecting the kids. Yeah. So the kids have to wear it to protect grandma. Well, guess what? No, that's not true. In fact, the children were masked for an entire school year to receive a $121 million federal grant. And that was a requirement to mask kids for the school year. So they literally sold our children's health, well-being, mental health for a federal grant. That is disgusting. That was under Governor Cox, by the way. He could have absolutely stopped that. And that alone will be why I could never support Governor Cox. But yes, I will finish my story. (laughs) So I was ultimately terminated from the emergency department. Um, You know, I didn't get the vaccine. I was removed from the schedule and then, you know, ultimately subsequently terminated, which it was really heartbreaking because I would have volunteered there forever, even though I had my business going, you know, which is great. I still really have a passion for emergency medicine. So the full circle of that is, you know, I actually got elected to the city council shortly after that happened, which to me really spoke volumes of what our community here values, freedom and liberty. And well, not just elected, weren't you like one of the highest? Yeah. So in the, in the primary election, there was 12, a field of 12, and I was the top vote getter out of those 12 in the primary election, which I mean, here I am, nobody knew who I was. That was, I think, a huge testament to just the 
the will of the community. And I, I still believe that's the will of the community right now and, and what we value here. And so the full circle moment to that, because obviously that was a very difficult thing to go through with being terminated. I mean, I was an amazing ER nurse practitioner. And I don't say that to brag, but literally every review, you know, the annual reviews, it was always, oh, you're the best, you know, one of the best nurse practitioners we've ever had. And your reimbursements are great and patient satisfaction scores are great. It wasn't like I was having problems yeah, before like and they were reason. like, oh, finally, we got to get rid of this person, yeah. right? So it wasn't at all related to that. So it was a big slap in the face. So just this last week, I was invited to be the guest speaker for a um, medical coding professional group, their chapter here, their quarterly, I think, conference that they do, which they happen to use the auditorium there at Intermountain. And I was their guest speaker and I spoke on medical ethics. Wow. And it was amazing just to be able to share my story, uh, the unethical things, the inhumane things that I witnessed during COVID in our healthcare system. And that's not to say that we don't have amazing people in our healthcare system. We absolutely do. They do, you know, wonderful things for patients every single day. We need Western medicine, right? There's obviously, I don't think I would be alive today without Western medicine, but the things we allowed to have happen during COVID, patients dying alone, keeping family members away from their dying loved ones, taking babies away, babies who were dying from their mother, I mean, I could tell you story after story of things that were going on through COVID under the name of health, which again, I mean, even common sense, it just made no sense. And so even still to this day, my grandpa is very elderly, probably is not going to live for much longer. My mom was going to fly out of state to go see him. And, you know, thank goodness she actually didn't end up catching her flight because she got sick. Hmm. But she found out, had she have flown up there, and this was just a couple of weeks ago, they shut down his facility. They wouldn't allow anyone in or out because they were worried about COVID. Like, here he oh, might not live much. Yes, this is just a couple of Jeez. weeks ago. This is still happening in our healthcare system. It's unreal. So it was actually a really neat opportunity to get to speak about that at the very location where where it took place where it took place <laughs> yes that's crazy yes um i you just had a post so i kind of thought we'll transition into this you just had a post today like on my way over here i pulled it up and looked at it um you are also a speaker slash teacher tomorrow right is it tomorrow i am yeah so i've had some interesting uh speaking opportunities over this last week and the one i get to do tomorrow is teach the fifth graders the maturation clinic and it was actually really funny my 10 year old this is so, the best part yeah. so, so my fifth grader whose class I, I was reminding him today hey i get to come to your class tomorrow and teach the maturation class and he's like well make sure you look good <laughs> i don't want my mom looking all i know he's like i don't want to be embarrassed does he so know what it's about <laughs> He does. I mean, I've I've had <laughs> the con imagine I've had the conversation with him. So they are separating the boys and girls, and I'm going to take the I girls. Got you. Okay. So that'll make it maybe a little less awkward for him. But I just thought it was hilarious. He's getting to that age where it's like he cares what people think sure. and make sure you look good, mom. You know. So I don't know. I'm really tempted to show up in a, a Barney costume or. Or just something to Get your totally. Your all messed up. Uh huh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. My pajamas. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Um, you've been posting a lot about. I assume you're in Salt Lake and in D.C. I think. Where Over you, the last couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. What are? Uh, I'll just kind of let you run with this. What are some of the things that you've learned up there? Maybe experiences you've had. Um, I love following you because it seems like again it's like this. Uh, mom, small business owner, ER. And then all of a sudden you've just exploded over the last couple of years, right? Like everything you're experiencing now and people you're meeting and doing. And I, I mean, did you think you're going to be doing that five years ago? No. Right? Like it's so crazy actually to look back how God works because I've tried to always, I'm certainly not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes, but I learn from my mistakes. I will say that. And I make them every day, but I'm learning every day. But it's really been cool to look back over 
yeah, I would say the last five years or so. And just to see the stepping stones of how each thing, like I remember feeling really prompted that I was supposed to do this online marketing business years ago. This was like five, five or so years ago. And I thought, this is really weird. This is really out of character, but I feel really drawn like I'm supposed to do this. And so I did it. I jumped right in. I actually did have quite a bit of success doing it. But then I started not to enjoy it as much. And I, th I remember thinking like, why, why, why did I feel so prompted to do that? But looking back, the skills that I learned from that, that's what led me to my business, Bella 2 Medical. If I wouldn't have known those skills, that's what led me there. And also those skills taught me how to do things like campaigning, you know, yeah. like political campaigns, because there, I will tell you, there is an art to campaigning. Um, it's good to have the desire to serve, but you also have to know how to get elected. Yeah. And it was those skills that I learned through that online business and social media marketing that led me to the next thing. And then to see how all of the things that I went through at the hospital, again, where I'm like, gosh, I have such a passion for the ER. Why would I be let go? But to see now, I had to experience that because that's what led me to a lot of the passion that I have now in the political world. Right. And so I believe that's how God works. He prepares us constantly, and it may not always make sense at the time, but it will later when we look back. And, and that's how it's been for me the last five years and, you know, starting a podcast, actually, which... I applaud you. You are like the the podcast godfather no. of St. George, I feel no. like. You are, yes. And so you've inspired me. And so, yeah, having the Michelle Tanner podcast now has been a great opportunity to bring in now political candidates and, and other guests. It's not all, all politically related, but that, again, has opened up opportunities to meet new people, connect with new people. And, yeah, I was recently out in Washington, D.C., met with all of our representatives from our senators to our congressmen and women and it's just been great to connect with them again like i don't agree with most of them on a lot of things but to be able to have those conversations and up in salt lake is another post you mentioned on that was just on monday so just a couple of days ago i was honored i was invited to speak at the patriot ladies gala um, with some other awesome Patriot women here in Utah. So it's just been really a huge blessing. Really the people, the relationships, that's really my favorite part of what I've been able to do over the last few years. So how long did it take for you to realize though that like everything you just said, right? Like you've been led on a path and you've had to make sacrifices and you've had to do a lot of hard things and get out of your comfort zone and all that, right? Yeah. But how long did it take for you to realize, okay, all of these dominoes that fell down down here and sucked and it hurt and it, it it tears and blood and you know whatever all of these issues I had to go through now led me to being on the track for this and and maybe sprinkle in some like none of that was easy getting here right, right. and there's still more to go but I I think that people that look at business owners or I mean everything you've accomplished in a very short amount of time if you would have fallen down and let yourself stay down back here, none, none of this happens. And um, people that are just on audio, I'm motioning with my hands, but <laughs> if the beginning hard stuff didn't happen and you let that part break you, look at everything else you never would have experienced, right? Um, so do you have a story or maybe something you can share with a couple of those? You don't have to get too personal or anything, but um, I just think people see too much of the triumph and what I've became mm. and no one viewed all the shit you had to go through, yeah, right? And all the hard stuff you had to go through and relationships that got severed and and best friends that turn out to be and you don't talk to them anymore and, and whatever that is, right? Like right. I'm, I'm naming things that I've gone through in my yeah. life, but it I, it's a skill. This is why I bring this up. I think it's a skill and there's things I'm learning about in my life right now. Like I'm going through it right now that I'm like, dang, dude, this happened back here because this had to fall for me to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're right down that track on what you're talking about right now. Yeah. Is there anything that kind of spurs your yeah. memory? Yeah. I on mean, that? you hit on such an amazing point. And this is something that I tell my 10 year old son all the time is you only fail when you give up. Yeah. Period. Because we are here, we are on this earth to experience and to learn. And 
you know, I've learned that through making some really big mistakes in my life. You know, I can think of one a few years ago where, you know, I made this mistake and, but it was like immediately after I realized that was supposed to happen. Right. I was supposed to make that mistake because of what I learned from it. And I did, I learned immediately and I've realized how that lesson from that experience has protected me now, like from future things mm -hmm. that I've experienced. And, and really what came to me throughout that particular experience was that is why we're here. That is the whole purpose. It's not this, oh, the, this black and white of like good choices and bad choices, which of course there's, you know, good choices and bad choices in general, but it's what we are learning from those choices and that really I think should be the focus, not this hyper focus of this black and white. Does that make any sense? Yeah, for sure. Well, that's what I think being able to flip that switch is like the aha moment. And that's when you start and then you start recognizing those like as it happens. Right. Where before, I mean, like I got fired from a job. I worked at Checker Auto Parts. I was 17 to 20 maybe 17 to 19 and I I mean I lived there I worked every single day a lot of the times I was seven days a week worked every holiday because I got double pay you know like I, I was a manager at 18 and like when the alarm went off they called me right like I lived and died for that store yeah and then we it's a long I mean I think I've talked about it on here anyway I I ended up taking we would take drinks and candy bars throughout the day and then we'd pay for it at the end of the day or the end of the week. Mm -hmm. And then it would make one cell of $20 instead of 20 cells of $1. So right. it just made the cost average look better. Yeah. So in a nutshell, that's basically what we were doing. And then someone came in, saw the shelf of all of our wrappers and empty bottles and we all got fired over it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we got theft tickets. Oh, I had to go to wow. court. It was a whole thing. Yeah. And I was like destroyed. Yeah. Like I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I, all the family reunions and the friends time and like everything I've given up for this place. Right. And it's gone like that. Right. Yeah. And I look back now and I'm like, man, that took the cuffs off of me. Mm -hmm. Like that's when I started excelling. But at the moment, I mean, it took me years to get over that. Right. And I remember sitting there with the cop and him like writing me a, a theft ticket. And I'm so like, bro, crazy. like that's not like, that's just not at all what happened. Yeah. And I was trying to, I'm like, dude, I'm like a, I'm like an 18 year old Eagle Scout, never done anything wrong in my life. You know, right. I have like one speeding ticket <laughs> and, and, but I look back now and I think, you know, that all of that had to happen. I worked every Sunday because I was the only guy that would work Sunday. So I worked every single Sunday. Um, that ended up leading me back to going to church, went to church, started going to the singles ward, met my wife, mm. married my wife from the singles ward. When that happened, I went all in on my, my own business when I was 19. And to this day, I still have that. That's the mail route. That's still yeah, the business I have now. That's awesome. And I was talking to a guy today who's gone through something similar. And I think he might be a couple years older than me. And I told him, I'm like, man, I, I know right now this sucks. And it's hard. And everyone's going to tell you, dude, you're going to be great. And, and you don't believe it. But man, like, just keep pushing forward. Just keep pushing forward. And I was like, I went through that. I didn't realize it till right. years later, but uh, that took the cuffs off me. That that let me go. Absolutely. And I had a similar thing at the post office when I left the post office because I have contracts. I worked for the post office, and now then I still have contracts now. And when I left there, it was the same thing. It just let me go all in, and uh, relationships, whatever. Right? I mean, I've got a dozen stories. Yeah. But now, when I go through it at thirty-five. I'm s I see it as it's happening. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, this was supposed to happen. Okay, that's fine. So now it's not a, you know, complain about it, get on your knees, cry, right. feel the emotions, all of that stuff. I'm just like, cool, get that over with. Let's right. go to the next thing. What am thing. I supposed to learn? Let's go. Yeah. And I think for me, especially with going through that, getting terminated was, and, you know, I was really sad and depressed over that, of course. But also it made me think of it when you said taking the cuffs off is it also allowed me to hyper focus on right. my business on Bella to medical. And I used that also as an opportunity to help those patients that weren't getting the help that they needed. I'm telling you, I was treating during that time and I still do some, but especially during that time, 
I was treating patients from all across the United States via telemedicine. I'm telling you, refilling insulin for diabetic patients whose doctors would not refill their medications because they refused the vaccine. Criminal. Yeah. I'm talking cardiac patients who needed their, you know, heart and blood pressure medications refilled again, like dropped from their physician because they didn't feel comfortable getting a shot that had less than one year of human data. Right. Right. It's really unconscionable to think. But I look at, hey, being terminated, I had the time to then go do more research, help more people and it's really humbling even to this day i'll be at like just yesterday i was somewhere with my mom and and this guy came up and he to my i you know introduced him said oh this is my mom and he looked at her and said your daughter saved my life and of course i don't really feel that way but it's still it's humbling to know that i made an impact in someone else's life you know he felt in his perception he felt like i saved his life because i gave him that care that he wasn't receiving during such a critical time of his life how cool is that how yeah. cool is that for your mom is so that like amazing I, my mom's the best she's she's so awesome that's awesome i uh yeah. being a parent will's only three but i just think like the positive positions you sacrifice the things you do and sacrifice to put him in those positions to succeed or what your mom did with you like how cool is that that how many years down the road right is she's like you know, it kind of reflects back to her of, hey, man, you put her in the position to save my life, yeah. right? Um, I have this conversation with my mother-in-law every now and then. Um, she's, uh, she was a stay-at-home mom, raised eight kids. Um, they have 20 years in between the first kid and the last kid. And all of, all of my in-laws are educated, some highly educated. We were counting them up, and this was years ago, so that's even higher now, but... Uh, we were at Amanda's, I think her pinning ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to her and she was like, man, it's so cool. You know, she's like, but when I come to these things with all my kids and she has kids that have doctorates and masters and everything. And she's like, I just feel like I've done nothing, you know, like look at everything they're accomplishing and I've done nothing. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I was like, I was like almost slightly disgusted. Like I looked at her and I'm like, what are you talking about? Right. Like everything you did and you gave up allowed them to get this Absolutely. far. Absolutely. And and she <laughs> she has a hard time accepting that, right? Uh, it, like literally accepting me telling her that. Mm -hmm. And and so I sat there and said, how many degrees have your kids achieved like all together? And it was like 17 degrees. Wow. And there were still two of them, I think, at the time that hadn't even been to college yet. Yeah. And then they're both going through now with mm -hmm. multiple degrees. And so I just told her, I'm like, hey, this th her up there today, that's because of you. Like, Absolutely. that's because of everything you gave up to put her in the position to do that. Yeah. And and like and I, I echo that because I think as parents, we need to remember that, too. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a part of that where. Like, I, I'm by nature a somewhat selfish person. <laughs> and so I think we all are to an extent. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone should be to an extent. Like you need to take care of yourself type of thing. But um, having a kid, it was hard for me because I was like, I don't know, man, I can kind of go do whatever I want right now. Financially, right. we're good, you know. And um, But you look at it now and I think, hey, like everything I do now Im impacts him. Um, me and you here today, someone that listens to this, like someone that listened to the podcast and – I mean, I don't know, I'm just dreaming here for a minute, but, you know, 20 years from now, they're like, Will, like, is, da is Derek your dad, right? Like, oh, I used to listen to his podcast or, right. or whatever, right? Yeah. Like, I think about the network and everything that I'm building around him and the sacrifices we have to give up. So, you know, as a, as us to our parents, to our parents, to our grandparents, whatever that lineage is, it's crazy to look back and think. I don't know how I got on. Oh, talking about your mom. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm going on a tangent here. No, this is good. But I, I just think about as a kid, be grateful for all that stuff. Your parents, and maybe you got shitty parents. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> but um, all the things that your parents gave up to put you on a pedestal and put you in that position. And then as parents, I feel like, and I've had a lot of talks on the podcast about this, um, but as parents, that's, I think that's our duty to, among a lot of other things, 
but that's I think that's our duty to have our kids stand on our shoulders right. a- and and be able to be strong enough that they can stand on our shoulders. Absolutely. And, and I'll kind of tie it back to me, like me and you and our where we believe is having that belief in yourself that the things that you can go and stand for like that's what that's what makes it that's what I'm talking about is like you being able to go and be strong and have those stances and being able to take the flack and take it whatever right um like I've always said I'm like I don't know if I ever told you this but I'm like Michelle's the tip like she's the tip of the uh spear over here for all of us and uh I figured as long as you're in city council I don't have to be (laughs) so (laughs) but no I'm not trying to pop like prod you up right here I just I think as a parent and your mom got to experience that it sounds like and I'm sure she has before and will again but um, that's what I look forward to I look forward to having that conversation I love that you told your mother-in-law that because that was actually a conversation I just had with my mom driving home from Salt Lake I think that was just yesterday and she was mentioning that she's like I don't know if you know you you kind of inspire because I spoke up there about finding your purpose and she says you know you inspire me to find my purpose I don't know if I found it yet and same thing I looked at her and I'm like look at all the things you know that I've been able to accomplish right I would have never have been able to do that without my mom and we all have a different role like we're not all designed to be you know in politics or we're not all designed to be teachers or or whatever it may be and my mom is the world's best cheerleader I will tell you she will prop everyone up around her she literally I attribute so much of what I'm able to do and the confidence that I have within myself and that's what she tells people she says I don't know I didn't do anything I just I just didn't hold her back I just let her spread her wings but it was that support and encouragement that made me feel like I had the confidence to do whatever I set my mind to do. And so much of that came from my mom and, and my dad. I have I have great parents. I actually have a great stepdad and biological dad um, that I was blessed enough to, to learn from growing up and still have in my life. So I know, I mean, you're doing this every day, um, every day of your business, every day traveling, every day at city council. But what do you, is there anything you're purposely instilling and making sure your kids watch and see of how you act or treat people. I don't know why. I just feel inspired to ask that. I don't know if you have an example or not, but um, I, like I, I have a few. Like I, I make sure every day I do my best. I'm not 100%, but I make sure every day I do my best to even just ask Will how, how his day was, how was school. Um, like I kiss him goodnight every night tell him I'll see him in the morning, um, you know, leave him for school. I give him a hug and a kiss. And like, I, I, cause I always felt safe at home. Mm -hmm. Um, I always, I have a lot of stories on here about how my dad was a kind of a shit person towards the end of his life. But, um, before that, when I was growing up, I knew I was safe at home. Yeah. I knew I could talk to mom. I knew I could talk to dad. Um, like even when we were staying out late and probably doing dumb stuff, mm-hmm. if I told my mom we were doing it and it wasn't like we were getting in trouble, but like, hey, I'm breaking the curfew tonight. I'm going to be at so-and-so's house. Right. Like as long as I told her, like most of the time I was fine. Yeah. And so, and she wanted that. She's like, even if you're doing something wrong, I just want, I can't back you up if I don't know about it. Like that was kind of her mentality. I feel right. like going into it. Um, anything like that that you, any. Oh yeah. So much so. I like mean. Like with you, your kids. You hit on a big one and that love that we show to our kids is so so vital and especially in today's day and age you know one thing that I really and I've told my kids I've got my 10 year old boy and a three-year-old girl so the three-year-old still kind of a little young to understand but my 10 year old knows as long as he lives under my roof he won't have social media I think that has been one of the key downfalls to our society. And I'm saying that as we're probably streaming on social media, social media can be a tool and I've used it as a tool. um, So I understand I'm still on social media, but it is destroying our youth. And this uninvolvement that a lot of parents have in their kids' lives because they can stick a tablet in front of them and they can watch YouTube and TikTok all day 
and get on social media, it is destroying this country. It's destroying families. We have to be so involved with what's going on in our children's education. That's another thing that I've learned a lot over the last couple of years is I was sending my kid to a school that I thought was supposed to be a really good school. I thought that they were focusing on academics and patriotism. And, you know, I actually learned that they had shifted their focus Mm -hmm. and they were handing out, you know, rainbow LGBT pins. This is an elementary school. I don't know what someone's sexuality has to do with an elementary school, yet that was the shift this school was taking. And, you know, it's no wonder that we have astronomically high percentage increases in kids now who, I mean, we literally have an intermediate school here in St. George where 20 kids think they were born in the wrong body. 20 at one intermediate school. You can't tell me that there's not a social contagion aspect to that. These kids need to feel love. They need to feel like they belong somewhere. And we shouldn't be allowing this type of really Marxist agenda is what a lot of that, the DEI, ESG, you know, that's diversity, equity, inclusion, those who are listening who don't know, or the environmental social governance, um, a lot of these things that are being pushed through our schools, through our corporations, it stems back quite literally to Marxist ideology. And allowing that to be pushed into our children's schools and educations, media, that's why I say social media, because that's a big aspect of it, that is destroying our youth. It's, we shouldn't be surprised that the mental health um, you know, downfall in our youth, it's at an all-time high right now. That shouldn't be surprising, especially after what we allowed to have happen to them during COVID. So I know I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but those are the things that I really strive to instill in my children is them having that assurity and confidence within themselves that they're not afraid to be the only one in the room saying no. Because we cannot allow our kids to just go along with the crowd because guess what? The crowd is going off the cliff and our kids will too if we don't instill those values within them that they know that they are children of God. That's where their identity comes from. Nobody else. Children of God. And so I'm not a perfect parent, but that's certainly what I really hope that I'm instilling in my children. Well, I think, I mean, you answered my question. I almost answered my question while I was asking it. It's like everything you're doing every day, right? So your kids having that strength, having that uh, self-belief, having all confidence, it's because they see you doing it every day. And so it's probably an easy, well, maybe not an easy thing, but it's a natural thing that you're probably, um, I would imagine it's just a daily thing that they get a witness every day because that's who you are. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to certainly be that example. It reminds me of I was somewhere not too long after I got elected to the city council. And and this guy asked me, he's like, how could you do this job? What would motivate you to do this job? I mean, you have young kids at home. Shouldn't you be at home with your kids right now? And I said, the fact that I'm a mother and have young kids at home is exactly why I'm here right now. We have to be willing to get out there, to stand up, to get involved in our local communities, because obviously, first, we have control over ourselves, and then our household. We have a lot of control and influence in our own household. That's that's key. But immediately outside that is our local communities. We have to be involved in our local communities if we are looking to the future at what our children are going to inherit, because the only way to restore this nation is at the local level, one local level at a time. And that grassroots effort will, I know it will, I know it can, that's why I still have a lot of hope in this country, is that will have a ripple up effect, not the top down, it does not work from the top down. It has to start in those local communities. And so it's a balance though. Like I, I want to always spend as much time as possible with my kids because they need that too. But I also know they do need the example and people to step up and be willing to pave the way for them. Well, and if you're, I mean, I'm just using you as an example because you're doing it. But if if all of us don't come together and protect that, then, I mean, I love St. George. Like, I I don't ever plan on leaving. 
I grew up here. I moved to St. George when I was seven. Cedar City when I was five. St. George when I was seven. And uh, I mean, this is home for me. Yeah. And so, like, like you're saying, like, yeah, d- d- would I rather be home with my kids? Yeah. But like, I, I'm being out here. I'm out here trying to preserve what I know and the place I chose to live and raise a family. I have to protect that. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think going back, like you were saying, from the bottom up. Um, like I'll, I'm not trying to selfishly plug my drink <laughs> sitting here, but like Andy Frisella, his big thing right now is, t- uh, s- um, gosh, it just slipped my mind. Personal excellence is the ultimate rebellion. Mm. And so I, I'm sitting there, I'm listening to everything you're saying. And I think, okay, well, if our kids are in trouble and I believe they are, what are we doing? It's, it's us. Like it's us being personally the best that we can that they're going to see that and that's the ripple effect that's what you're doing that's what you're talking about i'm just putting a different avenue to it but it's on us it's on us as parents is on it's on us as grandparents aunts uncles if you don't have kids people are watching you Absolutely. Um, like how many people i'm sure there's a ton of people that have reached out to you over the last few years since you've kind of become a public figure and, and there's so many people just sitting back looking at Michelle Tanner and watching what she's doing, looking at Derek Lake and watching what he's doing. And like, I don't say that like big headedly. That's not my point. I'm just, right. people need to understand like what they're doing. People are watching. And so if you're not out there striving to be the best that you can, and I, I'm far from perfect, you're far from perfect, but well, you're more perfect than me. But <laughs> no, I just yeah, mean what like, are you saying, Derek? <laughs> you're like, wait, 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 <laughs> speak to yourself. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just saying, but like I'm striving to be the best I can, right? And I think to change the generation underneath of us and our own kids, that's that's what it takes. And I, but I, at the same point, I don't know how we got there. Like I wouldn't say that my parents were lazy with with us, right? And so I think we're more under attack now than we used to be. So I think there's more efforts being pointed towards us than there used to be. My problem is the who's they. I mean, and I don't have the answer to that. But be uh, and going back to me being a selfish person and scared to have kids, right? It's like I have to get out of my own way to put that example out there for the community, for my son, for whoever's looking, for whoever's watching. Yeah, and I think that really goes back to kind of the overall theme that I'm hearing in our conversation is having that belief and confidence within ourselves to then be able to go out And like you're saying, be an example in the community because, I mean, I can tell you it's not easy when you go out and take public stands on things because it's not always going to be popular. I mean, I can't tell you when you mentioned, you know, I'm sure a lot of people reach out to you. And yes, 90% of the people who reach out to me, it is humbling. They are you know, beyond kind and generous in their words that, you know, they, they give to me and inspire me with. But then there are the, the 10% uh, out there who certainly, you know, they say they come from the, the all loving, inclusive community. But yet I have had, I mean, threats and hate quite literally from all over the world. Um, Mm. That's a whole other story, but it was from a HBO episode that decided to feature me on their show and you know paint me basically as this villain bigot when really all I said was hey I actually think that a TV MA rated drag show doesn't belong in front of children imagine that imagine that uh but somehow that uh definitely painted me as, as a villain and if I didn't have that confidence instilled with me to know that come what may I'm gonna stand up for my children and the values of our community and the rule of law, it would be really difficult to take a stand like that. And a lot of people can't because they can't handle that backlash that will inevitably come. And so that would be my advice too, is for people to just get over it. You know, like who cares? There's always, if you don't have people criticizing you, you are not living boldly enough. Right. I was going to say, let me unpack that a little bit. And you kind of touched on it right at the end, but you standing up putting yourself out there being willing to take the backlash 90% of it's positive right right and so 
like I've always, when it comes to business and marketing and standing up for what you believe in and us putting a flag, like having flag commercials with our safe store, I've had people be like, yeah, you probably shouldn't do this or say that. And I'm like, look, man, 50% of the people aren't going to like me anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just go to the other 50. And I would even say it's, it's more the other way. Like some people are just living their life, whether they agree with you or not. But right. the but the, when you do take a stand, people that do agree with you is going to be more than 50% for the most part, I would right. imagine. Unless maybe you're standing up for something that sucks. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully you're taking the correct stand, <laughs> exactly. right? Um, so just to piggyback on that about people watching, what advice would you get? Maybe there is a parent or let's say there is a parent that doesn't have that confidence. If there's a parent that is worried too much about what people think about them, um, and I guess my thoughts would be like, well, that's your duty, right? Like that's your duty as a parent to do that. But I, I can just imagine someone watching this being like, cool, Michelle Tanner, that's you. I don't have that confidence. Like, what do you say to that person? I think it starts with education. I think a lot of people who lack that confidence, it's because they don't know. They haven't, you know, just take the whole mandate, for instance. What gave me the confidence to stand out there, you know, and organize a thousand people in front of Intermountain, in front of the hospital to say, this is unconstitutional. It's because I've read the Constitution. I've studied the Constitution. I know what my God-given rights are that are protected by the Constitution. How many adults today can actually say that? And I think that's where it has to start. If you don't feel confident enough to stand up for things, start reading books. The 5,000 Year Leap by Cleon Skousen. That's a great book to start with about the miracle of America and the foundation of what this very nation is founded upon. Knowing those fundamental basics and being inspired by that, I believe will help instill some of that confidence to be able to get outside of our comfort zones. And like I tell my 10 year old, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. We are required to be uncomfortable in this life. For sure. I think that's a big part of it is you have to be willing. You have to have courage. You have to be courageous to be able to stand out. And and even just, I'm not saying you have to stand out there with the, you know, with the sword and the shield. <laughs> like, just have the conversation. Right. Like, if you're, if you're too nervous to have a thousand people come and stand in front of the hospital and protest or whatever word you want to put to it, then just have a conversation with a friend. Have a, but start building that. Start rolling that down. You know, start building that snowball up. Right. Um, have those. Do the research. Have the conversation. Take that feedback. Oh, you disagree. Why do you disagree? Okay, research, research. Come back. Right. Yes. And uh, that's what I think we've lost in in definitely my generation is people can't have conversations anymore. Amen. Like why why is it if we don't agree we hate each other? Right. And that used to just be like a high level Republican Democrat thing, but like good hell, it's like a neighbor thing now, right? right? Like if you don't agree, you you hate each other, right? And I, I mean, I again, I don't know how we got here. Like I don't know how we got to that place. And uh, social media contributed. I will say that for sure, for <laughs> sure. The algorithms and the affirming, you know the your own stances, the cognitive dissonance, it definitely plays a role. But I love that you hit that as, you know, disagreeing doesn't mean I hate you. And this is actually something that I got a unique perspective of recently. I don't know if you saw this episode on my own podcast, but I decided I had had Riley Gaines on to talk about the uh, bathroom bill that we recently had here in Utah and just her experience with competing against a male in swimming. And I had had Phil Lyman on who's running for governor who had sponsored a bathroom bill to keep men in men's bathrooms and women in women's bathrooms, right? And so I had had that perspective on the show already. And I thought, I think it would be really cool to bring on an opinion that doesn't agree with me. And so I did. I brought on Jamie Mitchell and, and Jamie's become a good friend of mine and Jamie is a transgender. And we had the conversation. It was a respectful conversation. We hugged at the end. We like each other. We're friends. But yet we still disagreed on some fundamental things. We agreed on some things, which was really cool to see and other things we didn't. 
And to see the backlash that came out of that episode on both sides. So right. you had the left who were like pitchforks, like, how dare Jamie go on Michelle Tanner's podcast, right? And then you had some on the right who were, how dare Michelle Tanner give a transgender a microphone? And like, this is America. I, if we value freedom and liberty, we have to accept that not everybody is going to agree with us and our positions on things. And we have to be able to talk about it if we truly care about bringing people our way, right? Well, I'm like, that's how America works. Yes. Or it did in the beginning, that's how it worked. Like, it, hey, well, what do you think? Well, where did you come from? Well, how did that work? Like, that's how this whole thing was built. Right. That's how, at every level, that's how the whole thing was built. That's what blows my mind about how, that's what I mean. Like, how did we accelerate so fast to where, again, like, the majority of us were just busy living our lives. Right. And then it just, and again, like, COVID is what just opened my eyes to the whole thing. And I think it opened my eyes more because... I was on the side of, I'm not wearing a mask. Like, what? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, show me. And then to see how many of my, like, close friends that I thought I was so aligned with, you know, just in everyday life, that I was, it just opened my eyes to be like, well, man, maybe we don't align as much as I thought we did. And, uh, and again, like, I'm still friends with all those people. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I mean, we don't, uh, we disagree on a handful of things, right? Right. And uh, luckily, I think I'm coming out on the right side of it. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> Absolutely, you are. <laughs> like we, that's what I, I had a uh, Jake Erickson come on and he brought a little tablet and we did like a full COVID episode, mm -hmm. like maybe mid COVID. Mm -hmm. And he, I, and I told him, I said, dude, I want to do this because in five years, I want to be able to come back and be like, nope, I was saying that I was standing up for that. Like I. Not like, ha ha, I was right. Not that. And yeah. I could have been wrong, right? Like I was willing to put myself out there to be wrong too. Right. Um, I was pretty sure I wasn't, but I was like, I want that documented and want a video and a podcast of me and you going back and forth with the facts. Right. And, and you know, years from now being like, hey, remember when we talked about that? Yeah, dude, you can go back on the, and, and look at it, but. And that's the beauty of America is we have the right to fail. We have this misinformation disinformation campaign coming from our very own government you know and they're they're partnered with people like zuckerberg to try to quote fact check people and oh you're spreading misinformation disinformation that is such a violation of our rights we have the right to an opinion what gives government any authority to say that you know even during COVID, you were having that conversation with someone what gives them the right to come in and say that what you guys were saying was right or wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, we actually got the little banner put on that episode mm, of like, I'm sure I can't even remember what it said now, but like misinformation, check the CDC for current, mm -hmm. whatever. And, uh, it kind of, it made me laugh. Like we weren't up a day and all of a sudden we got those banners put all over everything. And I thought like, I'm just Derek Lake. I'm just a <laughs> dude in St. George. Like I, I'm anyway, I, it was, it was kind of the same thing when you just said that I, uh, they put out a thing saying that the business owners had to put a, a sign up that said, that. like, you have to wear a mask in this establishment. Or not you have to, but I think it said something like, we suggest you wear a mask in this establishment, yada, 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 yada. And I, like, laughed. Like, I thought it was a joke. Yeah. And so I started go. I went into one of my buddy's businesses, really, really good friend, and I saw it on the doors. I walked in, and I'm like, like, I thought he was just being funny about right. it and put it up. So I'm like, dude, what's with the sign on the door? And he's like, oh, dude, if we don't put that up, the city's going to come after us. And I, I was like, what do you, who's going to come after yeah, you? And he said, I, I know, I know of a guy that knows the city attorney. And he said that they'll come after us. And this is all hearsay, right? I didn't, right. that's not for me straight. Right. Um, he said, yeah, that they, they will have lawsuits if we don't put that up. And I just laughed at him. I'm like, dude, like you're getting, and he was on the same stance as me yeah. about all of it. And People I thought, were like, scared, man. <laughs> Do you know what I did at my business when that came out? Because I did. I got the email and the thing in the mail of, oh, you got to put this on your business. So <laughs> I had a sticker made that said, constitutionally compliant business mask choice. Because <laughs> it's like, if you want to wear a mask, I don't care. Yeah. Wear a freaking mask. But I'm sure as hell not going to make you. And I'm not going to unless right. I feel like, you know, in the medical profession, if I was up in someone's face, sure, I would put on a mask. But 
Well, that's what I thought. I'm like, we sell safes. Right. Like I, and I can't tell you how many people came in with them on Mm -hmm. and then saw us not have them. And they're like, oh, do we have to wear? And I'm like, no, dude, this is still America. Like you don't have to wear one. And I can't think of one person that kept it on. And it was always, you know, pulls it right Mm -hmm. off, puts it in their pocket. Right. Yep. And and that's, I mean, that's what scared me again, back to that's what opened my eyes. And I'm just using COVID as an example. That's what made me even realize, okay, I need to take personal excellence more serious. Like if, if, if I want to have that stand, then I need to do something about it. It's like as good as Derek leg is, or as bad as Derek leg was in 2020, I have to be better. Right. Um, so again, like back to what would you tell somebody? I think it's just start like education was great. And I think it's just start those small reps, like start mm-hmm. building that confidence, have the, have the courage to get out of your comfort zone and have those conversations. And even if you're on the other side from what me and you are like, still get out and have those conversations. Right. Cause uh, again, it goes both ways. Like since when can we not have a conversation? I guess you would say us is the right to the left, but it's, a, it should go the same way. Like, if someone that's on the left side, come have a conversation with me, right? Like you invited them on the podcast. Like it, I'm willing to go both ways, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm right. Well, and that's, the same that thing. is, it's fundamental to America and truly, and that's why I get bothered when people on my own side, on my own team are like unwilling to even hear the other side or have a conversation right. because we strengthen our own positions by hearing what they think and how they think. And we will never, because I believe the goal is to shift as many people as we can over to to our side, which I don't actually even believe is like this rep- or, uh, Republican, like Democrat, you know, <laughs> thing like that. That's not, I'm an American I mean, man. really, we've come to a point of good versus evil, just to be straight, because it is. Marxism is evil. If you want to go back to the, the fundamental, which I believe God's plan is a plan of agency. Satan's plan is a plan of oppression. That is the very battle we are still battling out to this day. Fundamentally at the core, that's what we're battling. And if we are going to bring more people to our side of that view of agency, we have to be willing to have the conversations with them and risk them not agreeing with us. Yeah. And I'm not even saying you won't change my mind about a few things. Yeah. Like I, I'm open to have the conversation. Right. I, I'm not, I'm pretty hard headed, but like I'm not hard headed enough to not consider that I might be wrong. I mean, I'm not naive enough to think I might not be wrong or I might be wrong. Right. Um, I don't know. I, and that's why the podcast has been such a great tool for me. Like when I was saying, take the small wins, right. And just keep turning those and snowball it. You go back and look at my first episode. I was so nervous. Like, it's just normal to me now to sit here and talk to somebody. Right. And it makes it easy when someone has a conversation back and forth. Right. And uh, but that's the small wins. Like if I would have quit at episode five, I would never I mean, I've never experienced everything I have. Yeah. Um, How many episodes are you now? What number is this for you? I don't even Do we know. know. Like Ty and You're I were like talking. So far we kinda, up there. I'm like 129. Oh, that's so cool. Or something like that. I'm in the 120s. Um, that's awesome so I it's funny we had this conversation just last episode I think I'm like I'm gonna stop saying like what episode we're on in the beginning Mm -hmm. because we have like moved a couple around Mm because we usually we try to keep we're not right now we're not doing a great job because of me but um, we try to keep two or three backed up so if something comes up we still have content that Mm -hmm. week right and uh, maybe there's like something um, well, like when we had you on the first time, you were in the middle of your yeah, campaign. Yeah, the election so going on. we just on. moved you to the front yeah. and started pushing all your clips out. And instead of doing, you know, three of three different people, we were just doing three of you. Yeah. And so. Thank you, by the way. You're probably the reason no, I got no, elected, Derek. No, I'm just saying like <laughs> no, that, that gives was, us. The, that was awesome, though. That gives us the freedom yeah. to be able to kind of move For around sure. if I don't state the episode number when we start. But Right. Um. Uh, podcasting is a whole different thing. It's been such a blessing for me. And uh, I don't know. Do you have any experiences with yours? We're about ready to wrap it up. I just didn't know. I mean, maybe talk about yours a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, the Michelle Tanner podcast. Um, like you said, I like that you said, because I think people, when they see it and they know you, they think it's like this uh, 
anti-COVID, anti-establishment, <laughs> political slam down your throat. And that's not what it is. Right. And so maybe talk a little bit about it and what you some things that you've gained from it. Um, and I don't know. I'll just let you run with it. Yeah. Anything that comes to mind. Well, and I love that we I mean, speaking of the beauty of America, I love that we have the ability to start a podcast because unfortunately, what we have now in this country is we have a corrupt media and we have this disconnect that I've really been able to witness now firsthand being in an elected government position. Granted, at the city level, I even see it at this level of government where we have these things going on in government, but we have no real accurate way to convey some of this information to the public. And so oftentimes, by the time the public gets the information through the spin of mm -hmm. the corrupt media or whatever spin they want to put on it, the public's not really getting accurate information. And like we mentioned earlier, people are busy. They are living their lives. They are working. They are raising their kids. They don't have time to come to every single city council meeting to know exactly what's going on, right? And so it was actually frustration with that. It was frustration with there was a, a controversial story that came out about me in the media. And I literally had a reporter come up to me and say, I really wanted to report your side of the story, but my editor wouldn't let me. Wow. Yeah. That's where we're at in America. And so that's I a, realized. That's a local? Yes. Well, that was local? Yes. Okay. And I realized, okay, if I want any control of getting information out there, because I feel like there's things that go on here locally all the time that I'm like, people need to know. And I can't always just rely on social media because not everyone's on social media if I want to share something on there. And so that's really what inspired me to start the podcast of, of having a platform that especially here at the local level, if there's things going on that I think people really need to be aware of, I can have an avenue to get people on there to help get that message out. So a lot of it is focused around local politics, but that's inevitably had a ripple effect up to the state level and even the national level. And so... I've, yeah, I've had just such a wide variety of guests on from, from different viewpoints. So like you mentioned, it's not just all the time this echo chamber because truly I enjoy, in fact, I got some flack because when I had Jamie Mitchell on, who's from the transgender community, I said, this is one of my favorite episodes I've ever done. And people were like, what? How dare you? You just had Riley Gaines on. How can right. you say this is your favorite episode? I saw that. And it's because... I so enjoyed being able to have a civil conversation with someone that we did not agree on everything because that's so missing in America. Um, so yeah, that's I try to inspire with the podcast. I try to educate, inform, and really just bring truth because that's what we need in this country. So what's the future? What's the future for, if you can talk about it, maybe you can't, I don't know. Oh, no, I mean, I'm an open book. I never say never, <laughs> right? Um, so I will say that. I, I don't know. I always, you know, even like I mentioned before, looking back over the last five years and all kind of the stepping stones that have like led to the next thing, um, you know, I do. I believe that I'm on the right path. I know that I am super passionate about our country and our children and doing everything I can within my personal ability and power to restore this great nation. And what does that look like? I don't really right. know other I than wasn't trying to put you on I'm, the spot. No, I know. Other than I'm just I know I'm going to always be involved in one way or another because I believe in fact I'll share this because it happened not too long ago. I was driving and I actually was really kind of down and depressed about some things that had happened politically. And I was just kind of stirred up with emotion thinking, oh, why do I have to care so much? And I'm literally having this conversation in my head. And the words came to me so clear. I gave you that fire. And I'm not unique. We all have things we're passionate about and it's for a purpose follow it. And so I know this is where my passion is. So I'm going to keep going wherever it leads. Well, I appreciate everything you're doing. Every time I talk to you, I tell you that I, uh, 
I feel like you're fighting the fight. So some of us don't have to as hard. So <laughs> I don't know if you'd love that, but, uh, I really appreciate everything you're doing. I, I feel I, and it's, it's not a good thing for me, but I feel like I can be more hands off because I know you're out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. If well, that I, puts I too appreciate much... the confidence for <laughs> sure, but, I don't but I love what you're doing because you. like we all have different things and skill sets and we're all here for a divine purpose. It's not a coincidence that we're all here on the earth at this point in time and we're not all here to do the same thing. And yeah. so I think it's awesome what you're doing and you're still using your voice for good and it's powerful. So thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate that. Um, all right, guys, that's uh, Michelle Tanner, councilwoman, small business owner, mom, wife. What else? Inspirer. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about all that, <laughs> but thank you. But no, thanks for cutting some time in for us. It was kind of Anytime. a, hey, I want you to come on. And I think we were like, hey, what about Thursday? Let's or do it tomorrow. Yeah, 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 it was pretty quick. So uh, anyway, appreciate it. I know you're busy and I always have a good time when I'm with you. So I appreciate all the kind words and all the strength that you have. So I, I really mean that. I Again, I don't need to float your boat anymore. So. Hey, I'll take it. I'll take all the all the floating I can get. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, we'll wrap that up. Um, all right, guys, that's our episode again with our return guest, Michelle Tanner, uh, councilwoman. Make sure you follow her 